Good morning. Thanks, Anne Marina. Again, my name is Stephen Estoya. I'm the director of the USDA Climate Hub. Um, I was pleased to be a part of the um, of the document that Anne Marina referred to that was championed by both she and, and Dr. Fedig at PSW. I think it was a very timely and useful product, and it um, it's been very helpful in a lot of what we've done here at the Climate Hub in helping communicate the um, both a better understanding around drought as a type of extreme event, climatic extreme event, and also the response set. So I'm going to provide a, a fairly general overview for that that I hope nicely sets up the, um, the rest of the speakers. Uh, before I get into that, though, I just want to acknowledge, as you can see on the screen here, the co-authors for this report, a good number of which will be speaking here this morning. Having some trouble transitioning. There we go. Well, as many um, of you may know, California is uh, um, experiences a Mediterranean climate where we uh, are lucky to have hot, dry summers, I guess, and wet, cool winters, um, where most of our precipitation comes as in the form of rain at, at lower elevations and in the and in the form of snow at higher elevations. Um, you know, some refer to California maybe as the golden state, um, given the discovery of gold, but really the modern day gold now is, is truly water. And that water is really the underlying scaffolding um, for both for our ecological systems, but also our social systems. Um, the, hydro the hydroelectric power plants in California, just on national forest system lands, produce over 11,000 megawatts of electricity annually. And that's enough, that's enough energy to meet the demands of 11 million homes in the state. Um, water and associated infrastructure is the foundation really for a $50 billion a year uh, agricultural industry. Um, one of the most uh, productive indus agricultural industries on the globe. And it, of course, when water is in short supply, um, it's quite a vexing issue. It's, it's the, also the backbone of some of the most contentious and um, troubling legislature to, uh, uh, to farmers and producers in the state with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is just starting to take form. Um, many folks are probably well aware of the kind of the blended uh, art and science in creating the U.S. National Drought Monitor. Here on the screen, you can see there's essentially 18 years of the, the drought depiction in the state. And you can see that in about 12 of those years, the majority of, or at least a good portion of the state, have experienced some level of anywhere between moderate to extreme drought conditions. And this is no, this is no mystery to those of us that are, are Californians. Um, it, it, it's something that we are known to experience and, and something that we have to work with as we move through, um, move through time. It's certainly a difficult and a complex phenomenon, um, just, like, just like hurricanes or other events. But basically is the absence or, or limiting amount of water. Um, <clears throat> so uh, droughts have a whole suite of different consequences of which our speakers here are going to be speaking to here shortly following this. Um, in forests, as, as I'm sure Dr. Fedig will, will um, highlight in more detail, Droughts have contributed to widespread bark beetle outbreak, outbreaks, extensive tree mortality, um, reduced tree growth, and potentially increased wildfire hazard. Um, we've had a, a loss or a reduction in higher elevations of soil moisture, and in some of our deserted systems and grasslands, it's affected the biogeochemical cycling as well as hydrological processes. Um, increasing wildfire hazard and this increased susceptibility to in invasive plants, as you can see in that picture on the right. 
Um, shown here on the screen, we see a depiction of the um, Palmer Drought Severity Index shown on the y-axis and going back there to um, just um, the latter part of the 1800s. And you can see their start there in um, 2014 that that was um, a, an indication that we've and also from records of, of blue oak tree rings that we experienced the worst, um, most significant drought in, in about 1,200 years. Um, it was not only characterized by large precipitation deficits, but also abnormally high temperatures, um, sometimes referred to as a hot drought. Transition, sorry. Sorry for the delay there. So some of the, I wanted to highlight too, some of the socio-ecological implications, um, high, um, excuse me, energy generation and stream flow. You can see here from this figure from the California Energy Commission data that um, in the years 2017 and even 2011, which I remember being a very, very wet year, um, that we had between 124 and 100% of energy generation. But in 2014 and 2015, outlined in the black box, that was cut by more than half. So there certainly has a, a big impact on our ability to generate hydro energy, but it also has implications for riparian or riverine systems downstream as well. And certain the socioeconomic impacts um, were felt across the state too, as is outlined in the red box here from the same data source. Um, millions of dollars of loss. Of course, as I mentioned, this is a this is a 50 plus billion dollar a year industry, but nonetheless, it was significant in in lost revenue, uh, financial other other financial impacts as well as as well as jobs in the industry. And we know that our, many of our, our systems are dependent on groundwater, switching, here, switching gears here to the, the ecological systems. And this figure essentially depicts a change both in composition and, and abundance of some of our, um, our high elevation meadow plant species. And you can see there going across water content from dry regions, intermediate, the intermediate to wet areas, that the abundance and composition of our, of our meadow plant communities shifts. And the implications for drought on these systems is very real. For long periods of persistent drought, we can get type changes from some of our sites that are a little more susceptible to uh, drought impacts from one type of compositional suite to another. In our forest system effects, but there are, were pretty large in that last drought and significant, but are again context dependent. Different species respond in different ways, and the age and size classes, of course, were affected as well. As we can see from this figure here, the survivorship across that period was quite different um, among the various um, important, ecologically important um, conifer and hardwood species there in the, in the Sierra. So that was just a, a really brief overview of, of what some of the effects of that last significant drought were. But, but what does the future look like for California and much of the West? Well, as, as many people online know that the, the world is getting warmer. This um, is a depiction of the max temperature, summer months max temperature for California as um, recently retrieved from the climate toolbox, excuse me. And we see that the historical temperatures were just about 97 degrees. And that's what, what was shown here in the blue for 1990. And then looking out across the rest of the century, we can see we have a steadily increase to about 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit as we move out to about 2090, which is significant warming, max temperature warming um, from our historical conditions. 
and this certainly will will um, impact the way that our ec ecological systems are able to respond as we we see a although I've noted warming, uh, maybe a, a, a more hot world around us here in California. Extreme events like drought um, are, are quite vexing for, um, for many of us who work in the resource management and, and, and the ecological science space. Uh, we have projected increases in extreme heat that we're expecting across the West. Um, but I've depicted it here using a CalAdapt figure. Um, if, if you can kind of follow that triangle here, you can see that um, extreme heat or heat waves, as uh, we sometimes refer to them as, in some parts of California, we think of them as four days that are at or above 105 degrees. Historically, we've had about you know, three or four of those events a year. But as we look out to the rest of the century, we can expect that by mid-century to go up to about 30 events per year and upwards of 50 or more by the end of this century. And, and that's a, a quite a, a impactful, heat waves can be very impactful, not just to our social systems, but our ecological systems as well. And uh, a dynamic that we're already witness to, which is expected to occur, is that we're at, especially at our lower elevations now, we're getting a shift from, rain, um, excuse me, from snow to rain, where the precipitation that's generally received. And, and we're, we can expect by in century a reduction in our snow cover, our snowpack, which is essentially for California and, and many locations around the West or the world for that matter, is our natural water reservoir. Um, and we're going to expect quite a big reduction toward the end. Now, this depiction is just for three locations in the in the Sierra Nevada uh, mountains. That's why it says north, central, and south. But you can see the general pattern holds there. And then when we think about drought, we think about it being going from, you know, having kind of short or abbreviated droughts to longer droughts. Droughts that are um, less intense to those that are more intense, coupled with precipitation going from wetter to drier, and temperatures that are cooler to warmer. When we think of those collectively, um, this is a really nice um, kind of conceptual figure from Allen 20, uh, 2010 that shows the kind of the current state of, of forest ecosystems being pushed out uh, of that kind of biophysical or comfortable envelope from one into a future climate where we see um, them going through that mortality threshold, um, and we, we can realize increased levels of, of plant mortality when these combined uh, uh, factors occur. Um, and I just want to point out quickly, these are um, on the right side of the slide. These are um, a depiction of essentially the, the climatic exposure space for various plant community types excuse me for the, the scratching dog in the background, the joys of working from home. Um, you can see that for, depending on if we see a warm and wet or a hot and dry future, that um, many of those plant association types are going to kind of be squeezed out, if you will, of that bioclimatic envelope. But of course, this is just based on, on essentially temperature alone, which we know temperature is, is not working in isolation of other ecological drivers as is shown in, in this next slide. And I apologize that it's not showing up as well, but I've always thought that this was a really nice figure um, by Lionel in Global Change Biology. And it essentially looks at some of the factors associated with uh, global warming, global change, like regional change and variability, as we just alluded to, temperature and precipitation changes, the frequency of drought, and then some of those indirect effects like fire and insects and mortality and how that really um, can promote shifts on the landscape. But then also thinking about some of the factors here on the right side of this, of this screen, the regional context and, and kind of our management, um, our management decisions pass, like um, the, the limitation of fire on the landscape, fuel accumulation, um, not shown here, but important are some of our, our uh, population development patterns, which especially important in the West and in California is no exception to that. All will in part help 
um, collectively drive uh, changes in um, both the landscape pattern and in our species composi composition that we um, that we see on the ground. Um, this is a, my last slide here, and I, you know, at, working at the Climate Hub, you know, we think a lot about climate vulnerability to help inform our management actions. We kind of know where the the sensitivities or the weaknesses in the system might lie, and we do that by understanding kind of three features of the system: the ex, its exposure, the climate, its hydrology, and soil. So a lot, of, really, that's around this kind of the physical environment of that system. Um, its sensitivity to that exposure that is a function of its biology, its physiology, ecology, and its adaptive capacity, um, which is which is in part um, ensued upon it by its evolutionary history and the underlying genetics of, of the species that make up compositionally that system. And collectively, that kind of lets us understand better what the vulnerability looks like and better understand the vulnerability. And we can um, have some better sense of what those impacts might be will inform future management actions on the ground that we can translate from the generative science community to those that are, that are um, doing the hard work managing our, our natural and working land. So with that, I um, want to thank you and I will now transition to Dr. Fedig from Pacific Southwest Research.